Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Art Hour of Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, and in this episode, we're beginning an exploration of some of the great art of Peter Paul Rubens, providing an introduction, context, and examination of who the great artist was and some of his great paintings. Rubens is one of the most recognizable names in art. He was one of, if not the leading figures of the Flemish Golden Age in art, and a supreme representative of the broader Baroque artistic tradition, which took its inspiration from Caravaggio and the Italian painters, but brought it into its own, especially in its Northwestern context. Rubens also happens to be one of my, if not my favorite artists, in part because his paintings capture the totality of the human condition in its fleshy, pathological, and metaphysical realities. And that is what we will be focusing on in our exploration of Rubens's paintings. Rubens grew up in the aftermath of the Council of Trent, during the acme of the Catholic Counter-Reformation against the Protestant Reformation. And Trent gave a declaration declaring that artists should offer spiritual meditation and theological allegory in their paintings. Art became a tool for the Catholic Church to counter the claims of the Protestant Reformation. And Rubens was part and parcel part of this effort to re-divinize art, to allow art to be a place of spiritual, artistic, allegorical, and indeed intellectual meditation and interior force to give our lives meaning, not just in the beauty we observe, but also in the stories and the intellectual characteristics that these paintings told. He was, from this historical context then, one of the finest artists who sought to realize this essential spiritual component to art, teaching and touching the human soul through paintings, and they continue to teach and touch us long after his death. One of the most iconic of Rubens's artwork is the fall of Phaeton. Rubens, part of that sublime Baroque tradition, took up the mantle of infusing allegory and theology in classical mythology or biblical and religious stories. And the fall of Phaeton is a perfect example of this infusion of allegory and theology in a classical mythological story. Phaeton, as we know, was not part of the biblical or Christian religious inheritance. He was, however, part of the Greek inheritance that was slowly married into Christianity over a millennia of theological innovation and synthesis, especially within the last 200 years of the Renaissance. In the aftermath of the Renaissance and the humanism that sprang from the universities with church support, continued even in the various reformed traditions of Europe, perhaps best exemplified in the reformed humanist tradition of Peter Vermigli, the familiarity with the high culture of Greece and Neoplatonism was part and parcel of the culture of the educated elite in a now fractured and warring Christendom. Catholics especially, and naturally so, took the declaration of Trent's artistic imperative to include the sanctification of classical mythology in their paintings. Phaeton's pride, arrogance, and destruction offered an opportunity to embrace the creative freedom of a non-biblical story and infuse it with those spiritual and theological meditations and truths that the church was now pushing through its patronage of the arts. We are all familiar with the story of the fall of Phaeton. Phaeton steals his father's chariot. Phaeton's father is the sun god Helios. Helios rides the chariots through the skies to bring the rise of the sun and inaugurate and bring forth life to the world. Phaeton seizes the chariot without proper prudence or authority. He flies into the air uncontrollably, uncontrollably, bringing death and destruction over the earth. 
The gods must take a split must make a split second decision to save the world from destruction being wrought by Phaeton. Zeus throws his thunderbolt, strikes the chariot, and Phaeton falls to his death. In the painting, the moment of decisive encounter is captured for us. As you can see, Phaeton is overturned, inverted, falling headfirst into the abyss below, representing death. The Horai, the winged butterfly creatures off to the side of the painting, shriek in terror. The solar bands in the skies have been disrupted by the incident. Taken together, the terror and the shrieking of the Horai and the breaking of the solar bands brings disharmony, the disharmony of the seasons, and ends the harmony of the cosmos. The Horai are mythological creatures representing the hours of the seasons, and the solar bands taken in their totality together represent the harmony of the cosmos and the harmony of the broader seasons that the Horai also signify and represent. Thus, the shrieking and tear of the Horai and the disruption of the solar bands signifies to us, the observers of the painting, the end of the beauty and the harmony of the seasons, the world and the cosmos, and the beginning of death, destruction, chaos, the unleashing of the unbearable forces of nature in their wallowing misery, death, and destruction. The light of heaven, where the gods or gods sit, is the only section of sublime light, representing the light and power of the heavens, where the thunderbolts of salvation came. The winged horses, as you can see, are now broken, free of their reins, and bolt in a myriad of different directions, continuing to symbolize the chaos, the death, the confusion, and the destruction that this episode represents. What strikes us in the painting is the pathological beauty to it. We see Phaeton falling headfirst, face covered while being disrobed, falling to his death in shame and misery. Chaos, as we've said, reigns supreme. Yet there is also a paradoxical orderliness to it. It reminds us that despite the chaos and destruction around us, that there is a certain divine providence still governing the cosmos. Even though we see the Horai shrieking in terror, the disruption of the solar bands, the bolting in all different directions of the horses, the falling of Phaeton to his death, there is nothing in this chaos, confusion, destruction that we witness that implies uncontrollableness. In fact, within the chaos and destruction, we find a certain sense of control, the control of the gods. After all, it is the thunderbolt of Zeus which destroyed Phaeton but saved the world. Chaos and disruption do not necessarily entail an absolute chaos and lack of cosmic control. There remains order and proportionality to the world, thanks to the heavens. Hence, the only light and the Neoplatonic point of infinity draws our gaze into the heavens. It attracts our attention as we scan the painting. Life is found in the light of the heavens, which slowly lead our eyes away from the central chaos of the chariot, the fall of Phaeton, and the dark destruction of the world below symbolized by its covering in darkness. The fall of Phaeton is not just a rendering and a wonderful artistic depiction of the story of Phaeton's pride and arrogance which led to his downfall. It is also, as mentioned and implied in our introduction earlier in this episode, an allegory of the fall of man in the Christian tradition. Phaeton, like Adam and Eve, brings death and destruction unto the world through an act of usurpation and pride. This death and destruction from usurping pride, rebellion, 
which is also carrying implicit political connotations that are otherwise hidden in the painting, but that an astute observer of the painting should understand, especially in its context, destroys the original harmony of the world, which permit chaos and death to enter it. That story of death and destruction coming about into the world through an act of pride and rebellion should sound familiar to anyone familiar with the Christian tradition. Yet, despite this tragedy, the light from heaven implies, as we've mentioned, that there remains an order to it all. We are not doomed to eternal shrieking and grief as the Horai are. What flows from the pride and usurpation, this false enlightenment from Phaeton, is the chaos, death, and destruction that we see all around us. In theological language, that is sin. Even so, the majesty of the painting in its carnal depiction of the cosmos and the pathologies it can inspire, the grief that we have for Phaeton and the Horai, sympathy for the mythical flying horses, an unadulterated sense of sublime beauty, meditation and contemplation over its signification, the drawing of our eyes to the point of infinity, which is the domain of the gods, seem to strike out at us and grab the very heart of our soul as we look at it. We are not disinterested observers of the grand aesthetic of the painting per Schopenhauer. Rather, we are fully immersed in the drama that the painting represents. We ourselves become part of it as our sympathies, our emotions, and our intellect. The entire being of human existence is brought into the painting. We see a sense of grand movement in the painting. The painting elicits sympathy, emotion, mercy, and compassion as we see the chaos, the death, and the destruction. As mentioned, we have a certain grief for Phaeton and the Horai. We have sympathy for the mythical flying horses. The painting brings out the best aspects of our human emotions, mercy, compassion, grief, and love. Yet the painting is also bringing out our intellectual capabilities and capacities. As we look at the painting, we try to understand, understand its meaning and signification. The painting is, therefore, also an allegory of the human condition and the human soul. It tries to bring out the twofold nature of human reality, emotion and passion, the intellect and the soul. And in doing so, we are turned to the heavens, to that point of infinity, the light above, where the thunderbolts of salvation came from.